We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. I want to say hello to everyone. My name is Lori Shulman, and I'm welcoming you to a common bill of digital human rights and responsibilities. Many of you know me as Senior Director of Internet Policy for a Global Trade Association. Today, I'm acting in my personal capacity with regard to a subject that I care deeply about. The thoughts here expressed today are my own in my role as moderator and do not re represent my employer. This session will explore the role and function of a digital bill of rights, which is guided by fundamental, universal human values that transcend our differences. Common principles and values are typically expressed as charters or bill of rights and provide the framework for emerging governance and, excuse me, and provide the framework for emerging governance mechanisms. At the current stage of internet governance, this process is in its infancy and arguably it hasn't started at all. The rights of engagement and the rights and responsibilities of our digital residency as digital citizens remain unclear. This session describes the role and function of the Digital Bill of Rights and looks at the role of digital rights in the past, the present, and toward the future. We will set the stage with foundational constructs presented by Professor Klaus Stoll and Professor Sam Lanfranco. Then we will move on to a round table of experts that include Bruna Martins de Los Santos, Brian Beckham, and Stacey King. They will discuss how they see the role and implementation of digital rights from the point of view of different stakeholder groups. Finally, I will sum up the event with a, um, finally, Sam Lanfranco will sum up with a vision for building a bill of digital rights and a vision of the path forward. Path forward. Participants will be invited to join a follow-up event. This will be held as an open circle ID forum for questions, answers, and discussions around digital rights and strategies. I will drop a link into the chat that will lead you to the post session private discussion, open to the public, but off the IGS site. We are looking forward to the post session exchange. We're looking forward to the next 60 minutes. I will introduce our first two speakers, Klaus Stoll. He is the co-founder and CEO of the Internet Integrity Task Force, IITF. Klaus has over 30 years of practical experience in internet governance and implementing ICTs for development and capacity building globally. He is a regular organizer and speaker at events, advisor to private, governmental, and civil society organizations, a lecturer, a blogger, and an author. Along with his IITF responsibilities, Klaus provides consultancy services in the area of internet policy and strategic partnerships. Sam Lynn Franco, is Professor Emeritus and Senior Scholar at York University, and he is the co-founder and president of the Internet Integrity Task Force. Sam is a development economist working on issues of innovation and sustainability in the internet ecosystem, working with regard to the advancement of science in Africa, working with Dalits in India, working on global digital citizenship and engaged digital, engaged digital citizenship and digital integrity within the internet ecosystem. And I'm going to hand off to Klaus. Uh, thank you very much, Laurie. And uh, thank you very much online. And especially so uh, in Katowice at the end of a very long IGF. I just switch over to share screen to uh, uh, move, into the, move into the PowerPoint. And uh, Laurie, could you let me know if the screen is visible? Yes, we can see it. Okay, that is wonderful. Okay, let's just simply talk about the basics of a Bill of Digital uh, Rights and Responsibilities. I think it's uh, everybody's talking about Bills of Rights, but I think responsibilities uh, are come with rights. And the problem is, uh, it's not the problem, it's, it's a reality that our lives uh, uh, today are basically 
a, a duality between the uh, the real world and the virtual cyberspace. And as such, we have not only citizens of our own countries, but we also have become citizens of cyberspace. That, of course, creates tensions. And whilst we enjoying the increasing impact of digital technologies, there we also are torn uh, by the lack of uh, our control over them. The result uh, is, uh, and the reason for this is that basically the sovereignty ends at the border. Old political constructs like governments, where you could say, okay, here my, uh, my country starts, this is the law of the land, and this is how it works, uh, has been, uh, is now a longer uh, valid in cyberspace. And as a result, digital governments is, uh, is more dominated by special interests and not common good. It's basically uh, uh, who uh, can exert the most power. We are moving back to uh, um, uh, back in uh, basically in pre-democracy times. That effective uh, governance uh, uh, in low, uh, national and global governments has a very profound effect on ourselves because we don't know as persons, as, a, uh, as people, how do we exercise our rights and responsibilities in cyberspace. So the missing link, basically, and the, which uh, the whole, uh, uh, whole uh, experience uh, in history has shown it, that uh, the missing link is basically uh, a construct like a digital a bill of rights. Uh, as we cannot and we should not answer immediately all the questions regarding governance in cyberspace, because this is subject to a lot of dialogue, a lot of exchange and things we have to uh, dis uh, discuss and not a single group or, uh, uh, or organization can decide on. We can say with certainty that we need a Bill of Rights um, uh, and that this uh, uh, has to protect us against governmental, private, sectoral, uh, arbitrariness and depotism as we already experience uh, 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 in cyberspace today. So the role of the uh, and the fundamental function is that uh, of a Bill of Rights is to mean, remind those who are uh, in power to pay attention to the fundamental rights of those who are subject to their powers. So the key question is now, what core, core values should inform that digital bill of rights? It's nice to say, okay, we need a digital bill of rights, but what are the values? And gratefully we had after the uh, two uh, uh, great uh, world wars, uh, that effort to create the universal declaration of human rights. And, uh, this is a document which basically expresses the fundamental values which are common to uh, common to us all, uh, and it has a, a certain effects. It creates trust and uh, and uh, uh, because where human rights are expected uh, respected, trust exists. Uh, it basically provides a, a constitution for our global living together, and. It is also a very uh, important document of the economic side, because without fundamental trust of uh, 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 fundamental human rights, there is no economic development and sustainability. So, for example, also for in the context of the uh, of the uh, UN, uh, the sustainable development goals and the UDHR are so closely connected. That we really have to uh, uh, really have to see them uh, as uh, two sides of the same coin. So, what happens when we extend and then apply our fundamental uh, human rights into cyberspace? So, what's actually the thing? We can restore it, uh, because trust can be uh, uh, can be uh, can be not created through engineering. Engineering can give us wonderful electronic tools, but it can't create trust itself. So when people say, oh, okay, let's uh, engineer a system like, uh, like uh, a blockchain, which basically is, uh, uh, is absolutely safe and foolproof, that uh, is wonderful and that's important, but that doesn't generate trust. Uh, the bill will, uh, will shift the viewpoint 
uh, of the whole discussion and the, the current internet discussion away from these limited uh, uh, interest groups, uh, 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 limited interest to a, a common uh, human rights interest. So trust becomes a foundation of economic, uh, social stability and development in cyberspace. The other example is quite simply that we know who we are again and that our roles are defined. Digital users are able to exercise their rights and responsibilities in cyberspace. Governments will be able uh, to accept that they have to share sovereignty in cyberspace. And governments will be able to expect that their sovereignty ends at their border, but that they have can extend through cooperation, international treaties and so on, uh, based on the UDHR uh, or Bill of Rights, their, uh, their sovereignty. And the private sector will be able to accept that innovation comes with responsibility. Responsibilities become a source of economic prosperity in a new digital economy of trust. And I think this is also a very important sector because without uh, 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 economic underpinning, uh, none of these governance mechanisms will work. Another example is quite simply uh, AI. We are frightened that machines will become better people. But the real issue is not an engineering one. The real issue is not a, even an a intel, a artificial intelligence one. The real issue is how to build algorithmic uh, routines that observe and co codified rights and, uh, uh, um, and uh, observe uh, the, uh, digital bill of rights. Uh, the, the point is that everybody thinks that algorithms are neutral. No, every algorithm is bias because algorithms are human made. So uh, if we are looking, uh, uh, looking at AI, we have to see uh, how we can actually build digital rights uh, and values in. The same thing in the ex example uh, uh, with fake news and with, uh, with uh, uh, freedom of uh, speech and freedom. Uh, 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 the point is quite simply, that it gives us a framework in which we can apply our rights and our responsibilities. Uh, the fake news and manipulation can actually be checked and can be uh, and can be uh, uh, can be evaluate, uh, evaluated. So the outcomes is quite simply: uh, 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 if we have a bill of rights, it would enable a period of healing and restoring trust in cyberspace. We won't get there overnight. It will take a long time, but uh, but uh, but uh, this period of healing and restoring trust is absolutely needed. And to transform the values of the Bill of Rights into experienced reality requires ongoing awareness and capacity building, stakeholder engagement, integrity-based business models, and legitimate uh, digital government structures. Thank you very much. Sorry if I over uh, uh, spoke too long, and I'm open uh, and ready for question uh, later at the uh, at the uh, open exchange question answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Klaus, and you were right on time. I'm literally keeping a timer, given that we have one hour, and so I'm very quickly going to put the spotlight on Sam. Sam Lafanco, please. Thank you, Laurie. Um, let, let me get my share screen going. Uh, Klaus, you have to unshare first. Okay. I did. Okay, thank you. Just a second. While Sam's doing that, I want to note that I've dropped into the chat several links. A link to the post um, session discussion, a link to a YouTube uh, recording of a pre event. And Carlo, um, Carlos Alfonso has dropped in a, a very interesting article that was drafted by uh, Klaus and Sam. And Sam, take it away. Thank you, Laurie. Okay, my presentation is going to be about how do we get to where we want to go? Uh, and my little preface is that we're going to try and do in virtual space what it took several millenniums for humans to do in, in literal space. We're trying to build these structures that we, we spent hundreds of years building. And so 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about how we get there and how we get there a hopefully a little faster. Okay, what are today's challenges? We have weak protection for digital rights and we have very poor understanding of the notion of responsibilities. There's low integrity in our governance, business and societal entities, low trust. And our goal of course is well-being and dignity for all of us in a free and open society. And I'm reminded of Harari and his book on sapiens we are what we build and we can improve. Okay. What do we need to understand as Klaus has pointed out? We are digital residents of the internet ecosystem, what he calls cyberspace. The other important point is that our virtual and liberal literal combined construct our reality. We have social, religious, psychic and digital spaces that we live in. Good outcomes require integrity, integrity and trust. And that requires digital, digital citizenship. A very important point to understand is that responsibilities are not about subservience to government. They're about mutual respect for the rights of others. A quick history lesson. We knew what we should do after World War I, after that disastrous war. But we, we had an anti-multilateral attitude toward the League of Nations. We had bad economics in the Treaty of Versailles. The French and British competed to shape German reparations. After World War II, we did all those things better. The cost was the interwar period with the Great Depression, the Holocaust, and World War II. If we don't understand, if we, without understanding, uh, what efforts we do are flawed and our will tends to be weak. Okay. Today's internet ecosystem, governments defend and abuse freedoms. We have a mix of data privacy, limited data privacy, the EU, the GDPR, digital. We have digital surveillance. We, ha we have a suspension of expression and assembly. India closes down the internet in Kashmir for half a year. Now, uh, I'm, I'm yeah, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but your slides are not advancing. If you'd like, I'm happy to share your slides on my screen and advance them for you or ask you to please advance them. Okay, I don't, I'm, I'm let me back up and I don't know why they're not advancing. They're, they're definitely not. So you can keep going, but we just okay, want to get I, out. Okay, see if you can catch up. Okay, I will, I will present as though there are no screens. I'm, I All right, then no please idea. stop your share screen and I'll, I'll attempt to get us where we need to be for you, okay? Okay. Um, just hit, st I think just stop. Yeah, yeah I just stopped. I'm All sorry. Right. No, I'm really, sorry. and I'm sorry to knock you off the pace, but it was mentioned in the chat a, a couple of times and people are interested in the slides. So I'll share them and I will, I'll track you, okay? So you, okay. you follow along and I'll catch up. Okay, just let me go to my, uh, okay. so where are we today? Today we have governments that defend in small and abuse large. Uh, we also have what I call in the business sector, what I call digital colonialism, that the, the major, the major uh, FANG stocks uh, behave very much like the, uh, the Belgian king in the Belgian Congo. Uh, I'm on five now. If you okay, I, I, I will get us there. Okay. Uh, so we're very much, there's a kind of digital colonialism taking place on the part of the large businesses. Uh, we are basically in digital servitude. We, we serve up our data in exchange for uh, some social media access and being peppered with, with uh, ads to buy things. The metaverse is gonna be even more complicated because we will have either a persona or an avatar that belongs to them or is controlled by them uh, and is used to exploit us. Uh, at the local, at the, at the personal level, uh, we're in digital servitude and we're trying to acquire digital rights. Um, this is where we're trying to go. Digital servitude and digital exploitation today, digital citizenship and democracy tomorrow. Okay, next slide. Okay, future I'll digital rights. And, no okay. worry. All right, future digital rights and responsibilities. Think of the of the principles as as navigational aids. Uh, 
We need a global digital charter and we need national bills. The global digital charter is like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the agreement between nation states uh, and the national bills are how digital citizenship operates in each country. And as we know, digital citizenship varies widely and is evolves over time. So we have to have uh, the basic principles we need to develop. Uh, we need a global charter as a multilateral, multi-stakeholder project. We need national bills as national multi-stakeholder projects. The importance is involvement in, in, the, uh, in the processes. The goals attached to the path going forward, the citizenship, integrity, uh, building trust, and imparting integrity and trust in society's digital social fabric and its social contract. And addressing systemic issues through principles, not just uh, symptomatic problems, one at a time. Next. I'll have to say next because. Okay, Laurie. Uh... Yeah, it's not forwarding. Oh. It's not forwarding. So okay. just go ahead, Sam. I'll work on it. All right. It. So uh, what is the work to be done? We have we can strengthen the existing good works, greater constituency and stakeholder education. Education is really important here because. For a social contract, uh, for uh, a social fabric, we all have to be more or less on the same page. We don't have to agree, but we have to agree what the areas of, of discussion are. We're not there yet. Uh, we have to address the weakest weaknesses. We have to understand that digital citizenship is a right. It may vary by country and location, but it is a right. As I said, we have to shift to more, uh, uh, systematic and less symptomatic approaches to things. And we have to focus on two things that have been ignored in the last little while. We have to focus on the notion of responsibilities. If you look at the pandemic, people are, are declaring their rights in capital letters and they're talking about responsibilities as, as an invasion of their privacy by government. We have to see responsibilities as mutual, not imposed by government. Uh, and we have to extend policy, the policy focus beyond government. Businesses have to have policies, uh, communities have to have policies, citizens have to have policies. Okay. So moving forward, this is important. I hope you can see this slide. We need more cooks in the kitchen. Global charter and a global charter and national builds are not like finding a vaccine or baking a cake. We have to build education and consensus. We have to understand digital citizenship. We have to understand multi-sector governance. We have to understand rights and responsibilities. We have to understand the internet as an ecosystem, not a vacation site. We need broad stakeholder engagement in, and dialogue. We need a multitude of campfires, literal and virtual working groups, uh, symptomatic problem working groups, systemic issue working groups, multi-stakeholder working groups, we need a massive dialogue uh, to build a, a global charter of, of digital rights and responsibilities and national bills to enshrine digital citizenship at the national level. That's it. Sorry. Sorry for the mess. Oh, it was not a mess, Sam. There was a good message here. These are just slides and it's the ideas that count, not the slides. So I want to thank you very much. From this part of the session, we're going to go to a roundtable discussion, and I'm going to ask each of the roundtable participants to react what they, to what they've heard from Sam and Klaus. You'll each make a statement for four to five minutes. If you need less, that's fine, because that means there's more time for discussion. And after the three statements, get into the discussion and wrap up in about 30 minutes. Our three roundtable participants come from all different parts of the internet ecosystem, and I'm very pleased to introduce Bruna Martin de Los Santos. She is the German Chancellor Fellow at the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and a visiting researcher at the Berlin Social Science Center, known as the WZB. She holds a Bachelor of Laws from Brazil Central University, and she is a specialist in regulation, intermediaries responsibility, personal data protection, and human rights in the digital age. 
Next, we have Brian Beckham, who is the head of the Internet Dispute Resolution Section at the World Intellectual Property Organization, known as WIPO, where he's responsible for the day-to-day -day management and oversight of all WIPO domain name operations, including human resources, administration, finance, and internet technology, and related IP and DNS policy activities. Prior to joining WIPO, Brian was employed in a legal private practice representing clients in trademark, telecommunications, and nonprofit matters. He also provided strategic advice and legal implementation in relation to new GTLD applications. He is deeply engaged in the policy development process at ICANN. From Brian, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Stacy King, Policy Fellow at Oxford Internet Institute. Stacy's research is focused on the interplay between national and international regulatory structures and policies and the emerging development and use of artificial intelligence particularly as they relate to intellectual property, the public domain and commons in data. Stacy works for a US-based tech company, previously served as senior digital and IP counsel in London for a European luxury goods company and has worked at several US law firms. She is a member of the advisory board of the UK-based Center for Democracy and Peace Building. Stacy is participating on the panel in her personal capacity and is not representing the views of any employers past or present. I'm gonna start with Bruna. Bruna, please share your reaction to what you heard from Klaus and Sam. Hi, Laurie, and hi everyone in the room. Um, we, have a, we have a group here as well, just so you know, um, just about um, 10 to 20 people, 20 people, I guess. Um, so hello, thanks again for the introduction, Laurie. And um, starting with some reactions about um, the presentations before, I would say that maybe from um, a very high level position, you could say that um, citizens don't fully understand their digital rights, but I, also, I, I would also say that when we live in a world in, in which governments continue to pose threats to whatever rights we have, it's, it's demeaning to our understanding of what they, they can be, what do we need, and, and what, like, what rights do we in fact have. So, and just bringing this to, to start speaking about Brazil, because um, despite the moment that we're leaving, like with um, continuous institutional governmental threats and attacks to the current states of, of digital and, and human rights in the country, um, it's kind of interesting to see how some things still come up to like to our minds and to society as well. Like we, Brazil, luckily enough, has created a good tradition in multi-stakeholder participation and I guess processes such as um, the uh, Internet Steering Committee, the CGI.br um, set of principles for the internet, uh, internet governance in Brazil, but also the construction of legislation such as um, the Data Protection Bill and the Marco Civil as well were kind of the two main processes that allowed everyone to be in the table with the same level of parity to legislators, to the private sector and, and anyone else that just wanted to participate. And in those process, the compromise of the main actors that were behind them was kind of um, the key part, part of it all because we were lucky enough to have um, parliamentarians such as Orlando Silva at the time that made sure that everybody was going to was going to have something to say. And throughout this process, I guess that um, civil society and many of these sectors in Brazil, they got to be educated in this um, and what is multi-stakeholder participation? What is um, legislative, like lawmaking processes, and what and what are the stakes, and how can we ne better negotiate, and and also like talk to more people at the same time? So that is one thing. Like we need to um, continue, and that's pretty much obvious to everyone that's here. We need to continue um, including more and more people, and not just um, the policy wonks, not just us, but like including um, whoever else wants to join um, the internet governance and regulation conversation. And just to wrap up this, this initial point, um, we have also been seeing like a, a list, um, when we start to speak of a common set of principles or a, bi a bill of digital human rights and responsibility, um, we also need to discuss maybe who will be the ones responsible for implementing that. Because um, we have seen in the past year some very interesting initiatives such as 
um, the Internet Rights and Principles Charter, the contract for the web, and the two like list um, the most recent initiatives from the UNSG, the Digital Roadmap for Digital Cooperation and the Global Digital Compact, which was just launched. But um, if we are talking about in a space that's like very keen on multi-stakeholderism, but if we are discussing a set of principles that's going to be um, negotiated, applied and deployed in a multilateral or even like um, top level way, that's kind of not um, the way necessarily the way forward. So I just to wrap up, I would just point out that um, to me, it's also important in this conversation that we try to understand who are we aiming these initiatives at? Who are we talking to? And how can we better like engage other sectors and people into the deployment of all of these ideas and principles and sets of rights? Because um, some of them might have not worked. Some, some of them are still on the making. And um, I, I'm, I'm not yet sure, and I'm being very honest, like if we need a new set of principles or a new set of rights or just to re-emphasize them, um, if governments would just continue to refuse to uphold human rights and, and digital rights all over the world. So I guess I'll, I'll stop here because I might have gone over time. So thank you, Laurie. Oh, thank you very much, Bruna. No, you were right on time. No worries. Um, next, Brian. Brian Beckham. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And I, I should start by by giving a slightly boring uh, caveat that I'm I'm speaking in a in a personal capacity. Um, I. I, I would start by saying I completely agree with, with what's been said before. And so um, I, I would sort of, what I wanted to, to focus on was, let's say we, we've kind of accepted universally a certain set of propositions in terms of, uh, you know, rights and responsibilities online. And, and I'm already looking ahead sort of at next steps. If you look, for example, you know, we if you look at the at the uh, UDHR, you you have concepts of security and and order and and you know rights against in, infringement and and free participation in in, in society and life, um, and and so I think a lot of the focus has been so far on uh, what's done with one's data online, what's done with your data by intermediaries, by platforms, etc., and and that's a, a very important part of the conversation. Um, and, and it presents a really interesting dilemma in terms of um, privacy questions. And, and one of the things that, that I've noticed, especially this holiday season shopping online, um, is that there's, there's, a, there's a, a bit of a, a free-for-all going on online, and it's really difficult to know with whom you're, you're transacting business. And one of, one of the things that I've seen uh, emerging is, is a sort of a desire from legislators and policymakers to uh, address that. In, in the US uh, PTO, for example, they, they recently rolled out an electronic identity verification process um, so that, that uh, applicants and, and registrants for trademarks in the United States have to um, identify themselves. And in the Digital Services Act, there's, there's discussion of removal of exemptions from liability if there's not contact information provided um, by platforms of the vendors that they're acting on behalf of. And so this, this really kind of tees up a, a tension between the desire for, on the one hand, privacy and, and control over what's happening with one's information online as, let's say, a, an ordinary user and that same concept of privacy and anonymity applied uh, in a commercial transaction sense. And so one question is if there's a way to address this, this, this tension and um, it, on, on one superficial level, uh, of course, there's the question of whether there can be a, a, a dichotomy between anonymity for, for private use and, and a lack of anonymity or information about vendors for uh, commercial and public uses. It also deals with with free speech issues. And so, one of the things when I when I sort of look at this through the the lens through which I operate my my daily work, we run what's called the UDRP, the Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution Policy at, at WIPO, and and that's basically a way for trademark owners to tackle what's called cyber squatting or infringement of their brands online. And that's a process that was developed about 20 years ago. And, and it's been working very well since. 
And so one of the questions that's come up in and this was actually addressed in a, in a discussion two years ago at a conference at, at WIPO, this was actually on the 20th anniversary of the UDRP, was whether there aren't lessons that can be learned from the UDRP process that can be applied towards platforms. Because when you go online, for example, if I scroll down my Facebook feed or, or I'm shopping on, on, on one of you know, the big platforms, um, you know, let's be honest, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, in, infringing and fake products out there. And, and there's, of course, possibilities uh, to, to flag those up to the platforms. But what happens after that tends to be uh, a, a bit of a black box. I don't know as a reporter um, if, if the good has been taken down, if the person has reacted to my notice to the platform, if I were the vendor, I'm not sure what the process is for dealing with that. So what we hear from, from rights holders is that dealing with disputes on, on the platforms uh, is, is still today seen as a, as a bit of a black box. There's not really any clarity around the process, the, who are the decision makers, are there counter notice um, possibilities, et cetera. And so one of the things we looked at um, from the, the UDRP perspective is, are there aspects of this global uh, trademark abuse system that can be applied towards platforms, towards identity, towards speech, towards the various issues that come up with this intersection of the desire for, for privacy and controlling information and transparency um, for, for digital transactions on the other hand. And so what we kind of arrived at was in terms of the, the lessons learned from the UDRP that, that I, I would say, if we accept the premise that there's a, a foundation of, of a need to address these issues, um, the, the kind of the core principles were clarity on process. So in the UDRP, you have uh, several legal criteria that must be met. They're listed online in black and white for both the uh, accuser and the defender to see. So um, there's clarity on, on both the legal and the substantive process. There's, in the case of the UDRP, there's actually a, a human review of the complaint. And obviously, at internet scale, that's not possible. So what, what had kind of emerged was you, you need, and I, and I know Stacy is going to talk next about AI issues, is some sort of automation, but even the automation principles, um, you know, agreement on the, the legal standards, the due process standards, the et cetera. And, and so if you, if you are able to deploy um, uh, some sort of automation for uh, disputes that are arising, whether it revolves around speech or transactions online, if there's a need for an escalation process to where the, the sort of the decision-making process is plucked up from, from the automation and then turned over to the neutral decision maker. And then, and then a core question, and, and this actually came up in an article written earlier this year, uh, published in the Financial Times by Frederick Moster, um, was in, in terms of the question of due process is whether there's also a benefit, and certainly we've seen this to be the case in, in the ERP, for publication of decisions. Again, I, I mentioned, you know, if I see a, a fake set of something being sold on a platform and I report that to, you know, Facebook or Instagram, um, you know, it's not clear to me what happens to that complaint. And so in, in the context of the UDRP, all of the now 55 some odd thousand decisions that we've published at WIPO are available online for everyone to see. So you can look back and see what was the decision-making process? Uh, how was that arrived at? What's the result? And, and that helps to inform future decision makers, future complaints processes. And in fact, in our case, we were able to produce a, a body of jurisprudence around that. But, but the core concept is, is clarity on, on the process throughout from the complaints to the decision-making process to help inform uh, people. What are the rules of the road when we talk about rights and responsibilities in terms of, of digital transactions, uh, in, in terms of, you know, questions of, of, of free speech moderation and, and so on. Uh, so I, with that, thank you very much, Lori. I'll turn back over to you and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And I'm going to move now to Stacey King. I will also note we do have a question in the chat. So when Stacey is finished, I will post the question to the group. Great. Thank you, Lori. Um, I do want to just do a, a quick call out that um, today is Human Rights Day. Um, so it's, it's uh, 
this discussion is coming at a great time. 73 years ago, the, the UN General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, lots changed since 1948. Um, but one of the fundamental changes we've seen is the transference of the individual from a mostly real world environment to a split residence um, with the real world and the digital world. And these are all the digital spaces that we live part of our lives in, whether it's websites or social media, mobile, connected devices, whatever it may be, work now. Um, and the internet, when it was originally envisioned, we, we see it as a, a way for academics to connect and to share content or um, in, in some cases for governments to, to keep information more secure, but it has clearly moved way beyond that, that, that sort of way that we see the internet. It's now seen as something that moves markets um, and it is seen as a, a way to position countries in, in sort of global political power. And as we built these layers on top of the internet that gives governments and companies and other people not only insight into what um, traditionally has been considered a part of our private lives and our physical beings, um, we're also seeing some level of control, knowingly or not, transferring with that. Um, the people who, who built the World Wide Web, the people who built the internet, or the devices that operate off it, the businesses that operate off of it, they didn't have nefarious intent. So technology has been built on this concept of, can we do something? It's a puzzle, it's curiosity. It's built off of development and innovation and the desire to change status quo. Um, they, had dream, they didn't have dreams at the time of, of taking down democratic systems or monetizing human weaknesses for profit. Um, the same companies and individuals, again, approach this as a can we do it problem. Um, they were cry trying to create these interesting new spaces. Did they seek profit? Of course, companies aren't, aren't doing these things for free. Um, but did they seek profit at the expense of human rights? No, I don't believe that. And until recently, many people didn't think of something like the UDHR as being applicable to a company's business model or to engineering architecture or digital spaces that they use. They saw it as more applicable to governments who oversee communities, people, and their lives. More and more though, these lives are being lived online in digital and borderless spaces that are regulated by the companies that run them. Um, and there are many who understand the loopholes, the weaknesses, and ulterior uses of these technologies and systems um, and do use them at the expense of human rights. For the average person, and that can be an individual, it can be a regulator, it can be an engineer who's working at one of these companies or, or a CEO at a startup, how and where we lose our individual rights in this space is really murky. It's hard to understand the technology itself, what it can and cannot do. And as we do move into worlds that are similar to what you're hearing now, the metaverse, where our person is truly a digital form and a digital world, but with real world implications, or to um, this idea of general artificial intelligence, so truly intelligent machines, where we may one day turn over systems, operations, or a machine that, that allows, makes military decisions, or ranks citizens by their value to a given society by some algorithm. These systems, who builds them, what they're built on, what they collect, how they're used and by whom, and those safety nets against misuse by those with ulterior motives becomes really, really important. The technologies themselves have huge potential benefits. Um, it, it's, these things can cause like really great things for humans, but as the World Wide Web has maybe taught us, they also have the potential to be destructive if not developed and used properly. This doesn't mean we should prevent development and use of new technologies, but rather we should develop and use them in a manner that's guided by those pillars that, that the UN holds up of peace and stability, development and human rights, which seems you know, as a given, but it's really difficult. This is where it becomes difficult. And to do this, we have to actually inject, I think, a new cultural mindset from the one that's developed over the past three decades. So we need to move away from the, the idea of, can we do something to a question of, should we do something? Should we build these systems or use them in a certain way? Um, it needs to be more proactive in the thought that goes into these developments. Human rights are critical to this analysis. And we've already seen examples of human rights violations that are linked to AI, for example. And this is early days of AI. So mostly in the way AI has been employed, such as used by governments to identify protesters through facial recognition, or in the underlying data used to instruct algorithms, such as racially biased assessments of uh, prison recidivism rates. 
And we know that the encroachments that space is powered by digitization and big data um, have brought, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that many democratic societies are being tested to their limits in part by the misuse of data to target individuals mis with uh, misinformation. So it's impacting our social structures, our markets and our individuals. So how do we address these issues and make sure they become as fundamental a piece of development and business models of digital systems? That's the, the big question. It's not something that can be solved by one group. And, and Sam points out that need for collaboration. It isn't simply as easy as regulating the space. It's not as simple as stating, well, we shouldn't allow this technology to exist. And it's not as simple as pointing at corporate profit or power as the evildoer, nor on the flip side is self-regulation the answer because profit and power can corrupt. And we can't leave it to the individual to make sure they read the privacy policy and acquiesce because people do have a base level of rights, even in spaces that they don't understand. So we're in an unfortunate place of mistrust right now. And what we need is a combination, it's a collaboration of all the groups involved to sit down and agree there is a baseline we want to protect in these digital spaces, to brainstorm on how we do that. How do we build this in? It's a baseline of rights an individual has regardless of where they are and what they're doing. But this is a tough thing to do because everyone has gone to their corners and kind of are insisting that their way is the only way. And let's be honest, some stakeholders have made better attempts at collaboration than others. And the mistrust can be for good reasons, but we need to find ways to get past that. If we can't get those who fundamentally understand these technologies and how they're built to the table, we're not gonna be able to do this. And meanwhile, these systems that the UDHR, the, uh, UDHR helps to hold up, so peace and development and, and stability, they're eroding. It's critical that we take an honest look across all of our stakeholders, not at how much money we want to make or how strong we want our militaries or to feel like philosophical theory for what the individual should want, we're in an amazing solution that's not technically implementable. We want to take a look at those basic human rights that help secure ourselves and our societies and translate them to the digital persona. It's gonna take all of us agreeing on a base level of playing rules that protect the individual as these technologies develop, um, disrupt, innovate, all those things that, that we like, um, but ideally to make our lives better. Stacey, thank you. Yeah, I, I think that was very profound and looking at the dis different aspects of, of the question. We do have a question from um, the participants. I'd like to throw it out to the entire round table, but I'll ask Bruna to go first um, if she has thoughts about this question. And the question comes from Raquel Reno Nunez. She asks, besides the aspects mentioned here until now, do you think a digital bill of rights could help shifting the understanding of universal connectivity from a mere development and economic aspect to a more freedom of expression aspect, right to access information, right to education, and currently even right to health. Thank you, Laurie, and thank you, Hakel, as well for the question. Well, I think um, this has been pretty much on the agenda for the past years. Like, if you look at the um, UNSG, um, digital cooperation roadmap, there has been also um, a roundtable, a multi-stakeholder roundtable that was aiming to look into connectivity issues and, and how were they um, talking to other um, things such as Hakel mentions, access to information, right, education. And there is this um, at least a streamlined position that it this, these things are like all intertwined, but like there is also, to me at least, there is, there is still the part of the the implementation side. So the, not just the implementation, but like how our governments in fact, like um, what are governments in fact doing apart from just acknowledging that this is a right, that this is connected to freedom of expression, this is connected to access of information and everything else. So um, I don't know how to answer this question, but I do think that this is, this is a topic that, that has been indeed been in a lot of our agendas and initiatives for the past years, but I do also, um, happen to think that this is an issue of implementation beyond just an acknowledging acknowledgement, a general acknowledgement that um, we need to improve on connectivity and, and how this is also a phenomenal right and everything else. So I guess I, I would put it like that for now. Thank you, Bruna. Brian or Stacey, do you have anything else to add? 
Nothing particular to add from, from my perspective, except to, to agree and, and say that the short answer to the question would be absolutely. I mean, as these things converge, um, you know, more and more, it's, it's trite to say that the internet is integrated in our dirt, into our daily lives, but um, absolutely a, a yes is, is, would be my, my reaction. Thank you, Brian. Stacy. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with, with all of that. Um, you know, as more and more regions really come online, whether um, it, is, it is through a, a laptop or through a mobile device or, or some other means, um, and as systems are, are being deployed more and more um, behind the scenes that, that impact people's lives, um, that connectivity piece and getting people um, access is is absolutely critical. I would um, encourage um, as much as possible that we look at, at how we enable governments to to manage this versus necessarily relying on on private sector in, in a lot of these spaces. How do we again collaborate? I mean it keeps coming back to collaboration, but how do we collaborate um, to to try and, and get that connectivity out there? Thank you. Stacy. you said something that intrigued me. People have rights, even in spaces they don't understand. So I think um, one of the challenges are not just the end user not understanding, but governments themselves not understanding how the internet works. I mean, we've seen testimony in the United States where U.S. Um, representatives have asked tech industry representatives questions, and, and those questions have unfortunately conveyed an ignorance sometimes of how stuff works. Yeah. And I, I wanted the group to talk a little bit about that. I mean, we're talking about very high level concepts of human rights, but how do we connect the how stuff works with these very high level concepts in a way that would um, translate this idea of, well, even if you don't know what your rights are, you have them. Yeah. I mean, this to me is, is the pressing question that we need to actually work on quickly. And that is because um, when you look at what we see today in the digital space, you're right, people don't understand it. There is a small group of the population that understands how these things operate and how they connect and what they are built off of. I mean, even within a lot of the companies, people don't fully understand how it all works. Um, and it can be really technical. As we move into, you know, you hear about things like a metaverse, um, you know, which isn't likely going to be built by one company. It is likely going to be built by a wide variety of companies and individuals off of a variety of technologies. Um, and as you move into things like AI, where it is very, very easy um, in a short period of time to lose a sense of how things were built, what they were built off of, and the bias that went into them, you know, there is bias that goes into these systems. It's not all harmful bias, but that's the key. Like, how do you attract down those harmful bias? Trying to explain that to a, to a group of people, it gets more and more difficult. And, and as we build these systems out, it's gonna be harder for us to document and track. Um, and that discussion right now is critical. How do we educate people with a base level of knowledge to really understand what they are giving up and what they are gaining when they use these technologies. And when they're built, how do we build it in a way that is responsible? Um, that, if we, if we can't get that right and get that right soon, um, I think we're, we're going to see some, some real problems. I'm going to interject with a thought that I feel like the capacity building is, you know, so much, and very often capacity building is discussed in terms of end users, but I think there's a huge need for capacity building at the governmental level, at the regulatory level of having those who actually legislate rules understand what they're legislating because you can fall into some pits and we've seen it already um, with some of the privacy laws and some of the questions being raised in the European Union's proposed AI regulation. I'm gonna ask Brian or, or Bruna if they have any additional thoughts and anything else they'd like to chime in about. Yeah, thanks, Laurie. Just just one thing. I, I mean, what what Stacy mentions is you know gives a lot of interesting food for thought. And I think one of the things that kind of strikes me, um, you know, just kind of looking at the news these days, 
um, you know, in terms of, of collaborating and, and shared values. Um, unfortunately, I, I guess I would I would push back and, and say I'm not sure that we're even there. Um, and and so that kind of begs the question, um, you know, uh, you know, one person's uh, you know free speech is 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 offensive to another person, and so how do you deal with that? Um, you know, and and especially when the the lines between what happens online and offline are increasingly blurred. Um, you know, if you look at the at, at, you know at the GDPR recital four, it talks about you know the fact Fact that, that privacy is not an absolute right and it has to function in, in you know, relation and proportionality to other rights in society. You know, in the, in the US, we have this concept of you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's, you know, maybe it's high time for, um, you know, people, legislators to, to put down some markers on what are the, what are the boundaries on acceptable conduct. And, and, and that might help frame the discussion, you know, going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Bruna? Yeah, maybe just building up from there. Um, I think in, in Brazil, not just in Brazil, but I guess all over the world, we, we are kind of seeing this moment of legislators setting some boundaries. Like uh, we have all like, when we look at things such as the whole discussion about platform governance and intermediary liability and, and everything um, related to that, we have been changing um, a lot in the ways we all think this discussion because you can say that the majority of this, this debate around like, I don't know, platform governance started around Section 230, the e-commerce e directive and how we didn't want to be too impositive or too incisive over the, the internet environment and companies and such. But now looking at um, the internet we have in 2021, we can also look back at legislation such as the Marco Civil, the Brazilian one, and say, well, that was a good um, compromise for the time, but now there is this increasing need for us to continue developing, I don't know, boundaries or lines, but still um, with um, a human rights, human centered, human rights center approach, and also um, still upholding this multi-stakeholder participation we speak so highly of. But there is um, this changing, um, there is this kind of like a new tone to how can we regulate the internet indeed. And, and that is also something that's very interesting to, to see right now. I mean, unless we're first speaking about very bad regulations and must carry obligations such as the ones Bolsonaro tried to implement in Brazil, but um, I do agree that there is this kind of change in the tone. Thank you, Bruna. We have three minutes left. So I'd like to um, give the room an opportunity to ask a question, and then we'll give the final minute to, to Professor Lanfranco. So is there anybody in the room? We're so pleased to see so many in the room. To be honest, um, some of the rooms I've clicked into, there's been one or two people. So it's great to see so many today. Thank you. If you have any questions, please physically raise your hand and, and Bruna will call on you. Yes. Yes, um, we have Yari here. Thank you, Yari. Please go ahead. Hello. Um, yes, I just wanted to know how could you <clears throat> like how could you address questions of responsibility when it comes to, um, for example, um, automation um, decision-making processes that they need to, I don't, for example, attend people or examine people in health or maybe that they need to make a decision of some process and they and harming a person, a patient or um, someone that they are um, like giving the service. So I would like to know how could you relate, um, yeah, the human right violation and how the responsibility could be addressed in these kind of cases. Thank Does you. anybody want to take that question? Sam, you can take it too, if you choose. It's not limited to the round table. Anybody on the panel, Klaus, if you'd like, us to follow up with an answer, we can do that as well. So, Klaus? I, yeah. I'm sorry, Stacy. No, I mean, I, I would just say, you know, that is that is the big question, right? Not not just in terms of medical use, but I think in in all of these technologies as they become more and more interwoven um, into sort of 
what we traditionally seen as, as human activities, medical advice, um, those, those types of things, um, those are the places we really need to sit down and say, okay, how do we, how do we balance you know, basic human rights and basic regulations that we already have for those human activities and carry them over into that digital space? It, it can't be a free for all um, because it is interwoven with our, with our lives now um, in fundamental ways that we don't necessarily see. Um, when you do a, a Google search or a, a search engine search right now, um, you're proactively putting information out there and you know, you know what you're typing in and you're getting some results and can choose from it. But when you're getting a, a medical opinion on something, you may not know in the background that it's an algorithm that reviewed the scan of your lungs or whatever it may be. Um, and so, you know, we, we do need to look at are our, our, our laws and regulations and industry um, ethical guidelines and all of those things, are they fit for purpose? Um, and if they're not, and if they can't be extended to it, then how do we remedy that? And what, what do we value? Thank you, Stacy. Um, Colin Hayhurst has a question and then we're gonna have to wrap this up because we are at the hour. So Colin, if you could um, please ask the question and we can answer it quickly and we'll close out the session and remind that the discussion will continue. Klaus dropped a link into the chat um, and you can go right ahead over to the link. So please go ahead. Yeah, well, I guess I've got many questions, so maybe I'll join the chat over <laughs> afterwards. But uh, a quick one, I guess, um, would be uh, picking up on Klaus's point about uh, uh, new, new digital bill of rights. I mean, I would suggest, you know, things are happening too fast. We can't wait another a decade for, for changes. You know, we need to have companies, special interests, respect the rights that are already there, which are being broken. Um, so I guess my question would be is that, you know, Klaus mentioned that digital governance is dominated by special interests, not the common good. So how would you propose to bring those special interests into, uh, into, into that process and, and have them uh, participate in a constructive process? I think, um, <clears throat> I think the answer to that question, uh, I, I want to answer from the point of view of that journey which uh, Sam LaFranco and I took since the last two years. I was basically writing that series on the UDHR and internet governance and looking at each article of the UDHR. And uh, to be absolutely honest, I began that uh, series of articles and thinking, okay, we need to rewrite the UDHR somehow to uh, fit the digital age. And the more we looked at it, the more we got, we got a gobsmacked and in awe how applicable uh, how yeah. applicable the UDHR is actually for the uh, for uh, cyberspace, and it's not a question of writing something new. It's to translate one thing to, uh, uh, one into the other. How to extend the UDHR into cyberspace, and that brings me to that central question, which. Um, which uh, Bruna asked right at the beginning of her thing. So who is implementing it and who are we tr addressing uh, it? That's, that's a good question. What we found out there is a question before, how can we get these governments? How can we get these uh, uh, private sector entities? How can we get civil society to take and respect the UDHR as the ultimate standard and then act based on that? It's not about who, I think the players are in place and special interests have an absolute right. I respect special interests, but as long as they are exercised inside the framework of, uh, of uh, uh, the fundamental human rights, as simple as that. There's well, nothing, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna stop you there. Uh, you have one more sentence because we're well over time. No, it's so. okay, thank you. <laughs> Your final thought. I'm sorry, but um, the IGF is running on a tight schedule. They will just cut the link and that would be a pity to happen. So I want to thank everybody. I want to encourage people to go to the Zoom room that we've posted in the chat. I want to just remind give me a minute people, to open it. Be patient. Yeah. Okay. Klaus will open it. And Klaus, you can sign off and open it. That would be the easiest for you. And I want to thank everybody and very much looking forward to this discussion in the next few minutes and over the next course of the year and onward. Um, we want to thank the government of Poland, 
the MAG, the organizers of the IGF. This has been really a wonderful opportunity to discuss some fundamental issues that, that the people have been thinking about and will continue to think about moving forward. So have a great rest of your day at the conference. And we look forward to seeing you next year when, when hopefully we have a part two. Thank you.